have to have a word of prayer. All those who are able to kneel before our God and our maker, knowing that he made us all and none of us are above another. So Father in heaven, Lord, we lift you up, Lord, as our father, knowing that we are all your children. You made us. There are many that might not be acting like your children. There are many that are not living like your children. But Lord, we nonetheless know that they were made by you. And so we lift them up in prayer. We lift them up and we pray that you strengthen them. Send angels that excel in strength, that excel in love, that excel in intelligence, that excel in skill and knowledge, Lord. We ask that you would bless each and every person that is represented here, each and every family that is represented here, and that the words that are being spoken are the words that is coming from on high, that is coming from you. And so, Lord, as we open up the word, we open up, we pray that you open up our heart, and we pray, as I heard a pastor say, that I will be the nail that is nailed into the wall that only hangs the picture of Jesus. And so help us to see Jesus through this sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so the, the title today is Rivers of Living Water, Day Zero. Rivers of, Rivers of Living Water, Day Zero. Now, the number one point that I want to bring out here, that I want to bring out in this sermon, is we need to appreciate the Spirit of God the living waters because God's spirit will one day be taken from the earth. We need to appreciate, we need to really um, relish and not take for granted the spirit of God because one day this spirit, his spirit, will be taken from the earth. And if this spirit is not in our hearts, then we'll be lost. We need to appreciate the spirit of God. The spirit of God represents the living waters. And we're going to explore that today. Now, I want to start off with this anchor text about the woman at the well. And we've been talking about her for some time, even in the Sabbath school lesson, the woman at the well. And I think her story is very important when it comes to these last day events. This story is very important for our personal walk with God. The story is very important for helping others in their personal walk with God. And so as we open up this text in John chapter 4 and verses 3 through 26, and for those who are not uh, able to see the screen, um, go to John chapter 4 and verses 3 through 26. Here we see this encounter with Jesus. And we all need an encounter with Jesus. Amen. We need a daily encounter with with Jesus. We need a daily experience with Jesus. We need a daily uh, meeting with Jesus. We need this experience that the woman at the well had with Jesus. Notice what it says in John chapter 4 and verses 3 through 26. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So somehow Jesus knew that he had an appointment in Samaria. And we know that he prayed to his father and his father let him know that there was an appointment in Samaria. And so God has appointments for us. And as we pray, we will understand 
what those appointments are, when those appointments are supposed to be taking place, and and how we're supposed to meet those appointments. Jesus had an appointment in Samaria. Verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sitar, near the pilot, the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Joseph's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, see, Jesus was fully man and fully God. So, therefore, his flesh at that time was weak. See, in his weakness, he was able to meet his appointment. Paul says that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so sometimes our flesh will become weak and weary. And so God will help us to make those appointments in those times when our flesh is weak and weary. So here, Jesus had an appointment with this woman of Samaria. Verse 7, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. Give me to drink. He asked this woman to give him something to drink. A man, a grown man, asked this woman to give him something to drink. Now, Jesus, don't miss this point because the Sabbath school lessons said this uh, from times past. Jesus became a beggar so he can give this woman the truth. He became a beggar. His flesh was weak, but he became a beggar so he can give this woman the truth. How many of us ain't too proud to beg? How many of us ain't too proud to beg? Jesus here opened up the conversation with this woman by asking something from her. Notice what it says in verse 8. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask uh, a drink from me? A woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Let's go forward. We're in verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her if you knew the gift of God and who it was who it is excuse me who says to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living waters what does he give them what is he going to give them living waters if she would have known who he was she would have said, "You know what? I can't. I can't get. I can't get the the water for you. I, I I need water from you. I need the living waters from you." Notice what it says in verse eleven. The woman said unto said to him, "Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob?" Is Jesus greater than our, is our father Jacob? Is Jesus greater than those of the water company that we have? Is Jesus greater than our civil powers? Is Jesus greater? Yes, he is greater. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. See, physical water, we need to get past the physical thirst and we need to get to the spiritual thirst. And see, that's what Jesus is taking him, taking her. He, he, ta he talked about this, the physical and Jesus does this a lot when he speaks of parables, when he speaks of the heavenly things, he speaks of physical things and he's taking your mind to the spiritual things. So here's the transition in verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, 
whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Every day, we're going to need to replenish the water that is inside of us. Every day, we are going to need every maybe two or three hours, we're going to need to drink some water. We're going to thirst again if we continue to only rely on this physical water. We're going to thirst again. But God is not looking for the, uh, uh, he wants us to, 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 to quench our thirst with the spiritual water as well as the physical water. I think we talked to, I talked to Brother Paul earlier this week and we were talking about if you're thirsty, you're already severely dehydrated. So we need to constantly drink water, not just because we're thirsty, not waiting until problems come in our lives. We need to constantly be drinking from this spiritual water. If we're thirsty, then we're severely dehydrated. We haven't been constantly drinking from that uh, 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 spiritual water. Notice what it says in verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. How many of us want that, that, that spiritual water? Amen. I want that spiritual water each and every day. It, you know, it is important to have that spiritual water. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of springing up unto everlasting life. That water is going to, not only when you drink of that water, it is going to burst out of you and you're going to have a fountain of springing water unto everlasting life. Why do we go? Why do we need that fountain of water coming out of us so we can water other people? See, when we quench our spiritual thirst, then we can go out and quench other people's spiritual thirst. Look, forget Gatorade. It's us. This is what we need to do for other people. We need to quench that deep down spiritual thirst. Amen. Let's go forward. The woman at the well. We're in John chapter four, uh, four and verse three through twenty-six. For those who might have just gotten back, gotten on the line. Looking at verse fifteen, it says, "The woman said, give me this water that I might not thirst, nor come here to draw." It's like I'll save some time if I can get some of this water. I won't have to come here and get any water. I can just have it at my house, and it just yeah, just just pipe it into my house. Give me that water. And Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come here. And the woman answered. See, he's, he's, he's now he's now he's getting into her life now. Verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, you have well said, I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband in that you spoke truly so he just opened up her life he's just opened up the fact that she's thirsty she tried to find uh, 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 satisfaction in five other men and she couldn't find it because it's not there. See, in our spouses, we are not to be trying to find spiritual uh, satisfaction. That only comes from God. That only comes from Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And so therefore, she tried to find spiritual uh, 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 satisfaction in other people. But she couldn't find it. That's why she had to move from this person to this person to this person, to this person. I heard the young people, they, it's another uh, uh, slang terminology when they say a person is thirsty. Come on now, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. She was thirsty. This woman was thirsty. She had five husbands. None of them gave them, her the spiritual satisfaction that she needed. And some of us feel the same way. We are trying to find spiritual satisfaction in people, and we can't do that. 
We can't find the spiritual. We are thirsty, and we're thirsty because we're looking for the wrong hell. Let's go forward. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You will worship, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, we're going to dissect that term because we say it, we throw it around as, as, as Adventists, we throw around that worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Now, we're going to dissect that and add some more to it. But, you, you know, we can't, we, we can't dig too deep because God's word is infinite. And so, therefore, I'm just going to try to touch the surface. But we definitely need to dig deep. It says, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God, why do we need to worship him in spirit and in truth? Because here he says in verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why? God is spirit. We have to worship him in the spirit and truth. In order to truly worship God, in order to truly uh, give God the glory that he deserves, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we're going to show you how to do that today. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. He's going to speak the future. Jesus said that. He said in John chapter 14, and verse 29, he says, I tell you these things before they come to pass. But when they come to pass, you might believe. And so this woman says, yes. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to tell us the future. He's going to tell us prophecy. And notice what Jesus says. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He said, I just prophesied over your life. I just told you what was going on in your life. I told you that you have five husbands. I am the Christ. This is what Jesus said. Verse 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman yet no man said what speakest thou what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her the woman then left her water pot she forgot she was physically thirsty because she already got filled up with the holy spirit right there Woo! come on now she just got filled with the holy spirit she said i don't need that pot right now i'm about to i'm filled up i'm about to go tell somebody else i'm filled up this is what God wants to do for you. He wants to fill you up, and you're going to be like, you know what? I don't care about my physical issues right now. I am going to go share the gospel with somebody because I just found the Messiah. And went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come, see a man which, did, which told me all things that ever I did. He said, this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. I found him. How many of us found the Messiah today? If we find him, I guarantee you, if you have a an appointment with the Messiah today, if you have an appointment with the Messiah, you will go out and you will tell this gospel. And you won't care who said, who, what they, you know, obviously she might've had a bad reputation in the fact that she had five husbands at that time, at that day, it was way more, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, a social uh, blot on your or character if you had more than one husband. Today, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, well, I've been married like three, four times, you know, and this is my fifth husband and or my fifth wife or whatever. It, but back then, your reputation was was not good. She didn't care about that. She didn't care about the fact that she might have had a bad reputation. She All she cared was that she met the Messiah. Once you really have an encounter with the Messiah, 
you will not care what people think about you. You will not care how they see you. You will not care because you met the Messiah. Notice what it says in verse 30. That then they went out of the city and came unto him. They believed her. Her message was powerful. Her message was, was very convincing. She met the Messiah. Nobody could, could tell her that she did not meet the Messiah. And she was very convincing. And, and, and she believed it. She had confidence. When we speak with confidence, God wants to give us that boldness, as Brother Paul talked about last week. God wants to give us that boldness, but we got to put on the whole armor of God. And he will give us that boldness. But if you notice, she only had one Bible study. She didn't have, you know, uh, uh, uh she didn't have a whole series of Bible studies. She didn't have uh, Amazing Facts Bible studies. She didn't have uh, Dare to Dream or all these other Bible studies. She had one Bible study with the Messiah. And that was enough for her to go tell everybody in her city. Now, I want to make three points. Uh, a story. Based on this story, I want to, I want to make three points. Number one point, God gives you the spirit to work in you and through you. Let me add for other people. God gives you the spirit to work in you and through you to help other people. There's other people that out there that are thirsty. There are other people that out there are spiritually uh, 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 dehydrated. But God wants to give you the spirit to work in you and through you to help other people. Notice what is uh, number two point. One day God's spirit will take, be taken from the earth. And hence the first comment that I made, the first sentence that I had when I said, we need to appreciate God's spirit. Because one day, God's spirit will be taken from the earth. If it is not inside of you, that's it. And, and number three, living or moving waters are to give and bring forth fruit. Living or moving waters are to give and bring forth fruit. Number one point, God gives you the spirit to work in you and through you to help other people. Now, notice what it says, 7 through 39. Now, I did have all these scriptures on the screen, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some scriptures. I want you to exercise your fingers, exercise your faith, um, and go to these different scriptures that I'm going to put on the screen. But notice this one is already on the screen. It says in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39, in the last day, I can stop right there. In the what day? The last day. Are we in the last days, brothers and sisters? Are we in the last days? So we have to understand. There's a teaching that's that uh, for understanding the scriptures, we have uh, uh, local literal, future worldwide. Local literal means that this happened. This event took place in history but this has a spiritual application in the last days so it says in the last day that great day of the feast are we going to have a feast on the last day are we going to sit down at the welcome table one of these days in the last day that's when we're going to sit at that table so in the last day that great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. See, he didn't just sit there and say, you know, uh, he was in, you know, all timid. He, he cried out. It doesn't mean that he was weeping. It means he, he vocalized, he, he cried out with a loud voice. And he says, he cries saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. How many of us is going to come to him today? 
How many of us will make the decision to come unto him so we can get that living water so we can never thirst again? He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. So who is the living waters? He said, Jesus himself said, this spake he, or this is actually uh, John who said this, this spake he of the Spirit. So John interprets what Jesus is saying right here. He says, the living water is the Spirit, which that uh, which they that believe on him shall receive. How many of us believe today? Amen. So therefore, if you believe with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will receive the Holy Spirit. It says, for the Holy Ghost was not given yet, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And we're going to see why as we go to the next few texts. And verse 15, John chapter 14 and verse 15 in our Bibles. Let us turn there. I praise the Lord for the freedom of having a Bible, a freedom from opening my Bible and not worrying about if that somebody's going to break into my house and take my Bible, uh, 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 it being against the law. It's not the uh, state's Bible. There's some people, there's some places in the world today where you can't even have the Bible you want. You can, you have to have the state's Bible. And that size Bible is, 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 is severely edited. You have to have the state's Bible. That's unfortunate. We need to pray for those people because we have this freedom. We need to appreciate this freedom. Amen. Now, notice what it says in John chapter 14, verses 15. John chapter 14, verses 15. Praise the Lord. I hope you have it. It says in verse 14, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will what? Do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Notice what it says in verse 16. It, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And so therefore, us being obedient is the criteria of receiving the Holy Spirit. See, Peter repeated this in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. He says, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. Now, can you obey without the Holy Spirit? No. Those who are willing to obey, who humble themselves to obey, who says, look, I don't want to live my life anymore. I want to live the life of Christ. And so therefore, the Holy Spirit who is one with Christ, who is one with the Father, can come in you and live in you and live out the life of Christ in you. And so therefore, we need to be willing to be obedient. And then God, Jesus says, he will pray the Father. We, we, we found out what, what it meant for Jesus to pray for us. The heavens open, brothers and sisters, and when the heavens open, that means all the powers of heaven come down out of heaven. The angels, the Holy Spirit, uh, just blessings, all that is coming down from the Father when the heavens open. So therefore, Jesus says, look, if you love me, keep my commandments, and then I will pray the Father. This is a condition. If then, then this. It's just You just follow the train. Now, as we go forward, we're still on point one. God gives you the spirit to work in you and through you. Notice what it says in John chapter 6 and verse 63. In verse 63. As we're turning to John chapter 6, verse 63, here in this passage, in this chapter, Jesus, uh, after... Um, uh, the, he fed the 5,000. Then uh, uh, they come back and they say, hey, you know, can you give us some more, more of those fish sandwiches? And and he was like, okay, well, you know, I'm trying to take you to the spiritual aspect. So uh, if you if you, uh, uh, you if you need the spiritual bread, you need the spiritual bread. And he says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. 
And then he says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And so they, in their mind, in their finite mind, in, in their lack of spirituality, said that he wants us to eat him. Does he think we're cannibals? What is wrong with this dude? Are you serious? Now, notice what it says here in verse 63. John chapter 6 and verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What are the words that he's speaking unto us? Spirit and life. Okay, so he's speaking the spirit and life to us and knows what it says in verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, I say unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Praise the Lord. You're all in this line because it was given unto you of his father. Now, notice what it happens in verse 66. John chapter 6, and verse 66. I know I say this a lot, but some people have not heard this. And I need to drive this point home because they not received his word. John chapter 6, verse 66, 666. Notice what it says. For that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Wow. They forsook God. They forsook Jesus. Why? Because he tried to give them spiritual bread and they didn't want it. He was trying to spirit freedom the spiritual food through his words, but they didn't want it. All they were worried about was their physical being. This is, we need to get past that. We need to get past this physical external right now. We need to go to the spirit. We need to get past that and go into the spirit of life, which is his word, and live out his word in our life. And it might not seem that that's what, that is it, supernatural. It's supernatural to go against the flesh. It might not seem like what Jesus is saying is going to help in our lives, but if we apply it, I guarantee you, it is going to change your life. It is going to give you those living waters. It is going to quench your thirst, brothers and sisters. We're still on the first point. Still on the first point. John chapter 7 to 13, right on the screen. It says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But he had to be glorified. How was he glorified? He was glorified in the fact that he was crucified on the cross. And when he was crucified and he, he died, he, he was buried and then he rose again, went to heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to talk about that later. Why did the Holy Spirit fall on the day of Pentecost? That's a little commercial for later. Why did the Holy Spirit fall on the day of Pentecost? But since he went, went to heaven, that's when the spirit came in Acts chapter 2. And so therefore, he said, if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged I have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now now we look at this as the Holy Spirit working on the outside of people on the outside of ourselves reproving the world of sin of righteousness of judgment but God says he wants the spirit to be in you so that you can reprove the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment he wants to work in you now notice what it says in verse uh, I believe that's 13 it says how be it when he when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into how much truth all truth not 80% not 95%, 99.9%, but all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He's going to reveal prophecy to you. 
But whatsoever things he he, he shall hear, that shall he speak. And here, uh, faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so therefore, we need to hear this word. We need to learn this word. We need to study this word. We need to see this word. And so therefore, the Holy Spirit can use you to do those things in the verses above. Reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Proverbs chapter 8. Man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. So there, Jesus didn't just make up something. He just didn't say, I'm just going to make up a... No, he's, he's bringing out truths from the Old Testament. The words of man are as deep waters, spirit, spiritual waters. And he wants to bring that water and in you. The words of man mouth are as deep waters and so therefore we need to dig deep in God's word today Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42 let's turn there Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42 Jesus says something very very interesting here and makes it real simple see we 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 we, we try to get too complicated. We want to get deep in the word of God. Amen. But the word is still simple. It's not complicated. And we need to uh, uh, just, just, just look at it like a child. Simplicity. Notice what it says in verse 42. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple verily I say unto you he shall in no wise lose his reward wow that is powerful he said look all you simply have to do is just give them some water you can simply just give people some water a, a child in the name of a disciple and you, basically, you know, what the Holy Spirit gave to me just now, in the name of a disciple, and this is my uh, interpretation, uh, but that we're saying, I'm giving you this in place of Jesus. I am giving you this as a disciple of Jesus. I am sharing this with you because I am a disciple of Jesus, because Jesus told me that I need to do this for people. And so therefore, if we give a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, verily, verily, I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Amen. I don't want to lose my reward. We need to start handing out water, huh? Now, could it be that the diseases of the world, the thirst of the world, the civil unrest of the world, abortion the drying up of the river Euphrates there's a spiritual aspect to this but there's actually a physical aspect to this and those pictures that you're seeing on the screen are actually pictures of the river Euphrates and is being dried up right now it is literally being dried up but the spiritual aspect could be that these diseases, the civil unrest, the abortions, murders, all these things that are taking place on this earth are drying up the river Euphrates. Let's look at this next. Many people know what this means, what this is. We know where it comes from. The back of your dollar bill. There's a message on the money. There's a message. Notice what it says. In you will God favors our undertaking. 
Novus Order Seclorum. New Order of the Ages or the New World Order. Now, what God are they talking about? Because this is the pyramid. The Bible said, uh, the, 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 the dollar says, in God we trust. In God we trust. But what God do they trust? Because this is a pyramid. Inua Coeptos, Novus Oler Soclorum. So there is a plan that is taking place that is under, lying under the scenes. A conspiracy. But some people say, well, you know, here we go with the conspiracies here. But guess what? There's evidence. There's evidence. Even in the Bible, it talks about there's a conspiracy, conspiracy against God. And so, therefore, God acknowledges that there are conspiracies. So I'm just going to touch on a little bit. I'm not going to touch on a lot. Notice. Stones. There's a picture back here, but I had to uh, change my computer. And so I'm not able to uh, show the picture back there. But the Georgia Guidestones are, um, uh, it's like a monument that was put up. There was a monument that was put up, and I believe it was put up in the 60s or 70s. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, it was 60s, 70s, possibly the 80s. It was put up. It was uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars that uh, was put into this project. And this person who put up this, these Georgia Guidestones, wrote on there the Ten Commandments of the New World Order. Well, this person has to be serious to put up hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to put up this monument to send a message. And this message was written in, in several different languages. Several different languages. This is called the Georgia Guidestones. Look this up a little bit later. The Georgia Guidestones, notice what it says. Maintain, number one, in the Ten Commandments of the New World Order, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Is it possible that there's an effort to dry up the River Euphrates? Is it possible? There's a lot more on here that I would like to go through, but I just want to focus on this. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. So we can say this is possibly a conspiracy, but who put a hundred over hundreds of thousands of dollars to put this thing up? It's got to be serious. It's got to be serious. Now, the person who put it up, the person who uh, paid the construction company to put this up, and it was seriously uh, thought out, well thought out, because I think there's a hole in it that in a certain season or a certain time, the sun uh, shines through it. And, and to reveal a message. So this this is not something that is like, you know, esoteric. You can't see it. It's right there in your face. They're saying maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Now, what does it have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, let me go back. The person who put this up didn't say his real name. He just said his, he just signed R.C. Christian. R.C. Christian. Is it possible that it was put up by a person, Roman Catholic Christian? Roman Catholic Christian. New Ten Commandments. This is nothing new. They didn't, they've, they've been, they changed the Ten Commandments before. In, in, in their scriptures. So therefore, there's nothing new for them to do. So let's look at uh, 
look at the second point. One day God's spirit will be taken from the earth. Genesis chapter three, uh, six and verse three. We know this story. This is uh, the um, the Noah's flood, the Noah's ark story. It says in verse three. We're just going to touch on that. It says, "And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man." So remember, local, literal, future, worldwide. Jesus is going to say that in just a moment. The, the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, Jesus talks about the future worldwide here in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Did he not exemplify this principle? As the days of Noah were, local, literal, history, it was a historical fact, it, it happened. As But as the days of Noah, uh, the days of Noah were, so sh shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, future worldwide. There's going to be a worldwide coming. Notice what it says in verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Isn't that that message for us today? The message there, the present truth at that time in Noah's day was getting into the ark. The present truth for our day right now is the same, get into the ark. And we're talking about the ark of the covenant, brothers and sisters. We need to have a most holy place experience right now. We need to have that encounter with Jesus. We need to have that encounter with the Messiah. And so today's, uh, 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 what today's uh, message is get into the ark. Today's present truth message is to get into the ark. Notice what it says in verse 39, and knew not. So when Noah's, Noah got into the ark, they entered the ark, his family entered into the ark. The people around knew it not until the flood came and took them all away. What did it do? It took them all away. That's very important because some of the teachings of mainstream Christianity has been twisted and has been distorted because they're not dissecting the word of God like they should. And it says, and it took them away. So also shall the coming of the son of man be. So what happened to the people in the flood? It took them away. And so when you read down more and it says that two were uh, in the field, one was taken and the others left. There was two in the tent. One was taken, the other left. There was two grinding. One was taken, the other left. Where were they taken? They were taken to death, brothers and sisters. And so people think that when the rapture comes, it's talking about he took them. Rapture means caught up. So they twisted it. Satan has twisted it in the in, in the mind of the world, who's and they think that when the rapture comes or when Jesus comes, or it's going to be a secret and God's going to take them away, and the people are not going to. And, and, and well, what it means that it was they were taken was that they were taken to death. So I want to be left behind. I don't know about y'all. I want to be left behind. I don't want to be taken. Because that's what it means. It means that they were taken away by the flood. And so we need to be lifted up by God's spirit. Now let's talk about day zero. Day zero. The percentage of water, the percentage of we see that ninety there's uh, ninety seven percent of the water on the earth is salt water. Ninety seven percent of the water on the earth is salt water. It's virtually undrinkable. We can't drink it. And so uh, there's some people who say, you know, if you're lost on the ship, and hopefully. 
by the grace of God, you never lost on a boat or a ship out in the middle, middle of the ocean. If you drink the water slowly, then you won't get sick. And so uh, by the grace of God, you'll never have to deal with that. But um, uh, if you drink it too quickly, you will get sick. But 97% of the water in the ocean is undrinkable, it's salt water. 2% of the fresh water is frozen. 1% of fresh water is actually accessible and drinkable. We're living on 1% water, brothers and sisters, on this planet. 1% water. Most of the water is not even, you can't even drink it. Matter of fact, it, it will make you sick and make you even more thirsty. And so 1% of this water is fresh. Now, there's a water shortage in many different places in this world. There's a water shortage of fresh water. And so the uh, solution that they're coming up with is desalination. They want to take the salt out of the water, and but it's very expensive. It's, it's an expensive process to do this. So we're on a water, water shortage, and we definitely – uh, need to take heed to this. We need to appreciate the water that we have, the physical water as well as the spiritual water we need to appreciate because one day it will be taken from the earth. One day that spiritual water will be taken from the earth. One day the spirit, the spirit of God will not always strive with man. And so therefore we need to be appreciative we need to not take for granted the water that we have. So interesting. Uh, we have a river, Colorado River is running from Colorado down through Utah, down through Arizona, down through California. By the time it gets to Mexico, it's barely a trickle. Why? Because we have all these cities that are sucking up the water <laughs> from everybody else. We're sucking up the water from Mexico. We are sucking up the water, the fresh water. And see, we need to be filled with the spirit, filled with living waters, so that we don't suck up all the water from everybody else because we're just constantly thirsty. We're constantly not filled because we're looking for uh, spiritual waters in somewhere else. So it's interesting that uh, they talked about uh, the Aztecs and um, talk about the Aztecs and uh, this is a depiction of the Aztec city and how it was surrounded by water. It was surrounded by water and then we had the Spanish come in and they wanted the gold. They wanted the gold from um, this city. They wanted the gold that they were rich in gold. It was gold everywhere. Um, and they said, wow, we want this gold. And so they got so greedy. I mean, they didn't want to just buy the gold. They didn't want to just find out, you know, hey, where are you getting the gold? They actually, well, they did want to find out where they were getting the gold. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But they actually were trying, they just wanted to take the gold from them. They wanted to take the gold from the Aztecs. And so the Aztecs would do something very um, strange. And when you serve other gods, that's what ended up happening. You do things that are strange. You do things that don't make sense. You do things that is hurtful to you and hurtful, hurtful to uh, 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 the people around you. And so that's why true doctrine, the true message, is important because that uh, keeps everyone around you safe. It keeps yourself safe. It will be for your good. It will be for your wisdom. The other nations will see the wisdom when we keep the true message of God. And so what happened was the uh, the Spanish uh, was uh, going to the Aztecs and they wanted the gold and they forced them to tell them where the gold was. And they found out that there was a certain practice that they would do, these Aztecs. They would, they would Because they believed in this God, this water God, I don't know specifically the name of this God, but they would take the gold and they would throw it into the river. So at the bottom of the gold or throw it into the lake, uh, or that water that surrounded them, they would throw the water, in the, the gold, into the water. 
Now, to us, that doesn't make sense. It's like, why would you do that? Why would you not keep the gold? Why would you throw this gold? But they were serving their God. They loved their God. They said, look, where our heart is, our treasure will be also. And so they would throw that into, and see, we don't do that. We don't do that as Christians. We don't serve our God as much as some of these pagans serve their God. And so because they threw the gold into the lake, into the water that surrounded the city, the Spanish found out and they drained the lake to get to the gold. They drained the lake to get to the gold. Mercy. And so when they drain the lake, they drain the water. See, we, 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 we separate ourselves from the spirit of God because we're trying to get to physical wealth. We're trying to get, we're trying to be like the Joneses. We are, we are drying our well up because we're trying to be like the Joneses. We're trying to have that physical wealth. We want to be uh, physical uh, uh, wealthy when we need to be spiritually wealthy. And so they drain the lake to get to the goal. And not knowing that the reason why, and we want to talk about this later in, in other sermons, the reason why the Aztecs had gold was because they were getting them, getting it from other nations around them, other uh, civilizations around them. They were getting the gold from them. How did they get it? They had a spring where they had water that had salt in it. And they would sell the salt. Ooh, that's <laughs> wait a minute. That's coming later. I can't. I can't. Oh man, they would. They had a spring of water. That's how they were getting the gold. The spring of water had salt, and they would dry the water out, and they would take the salt, and they would sell it to the other nations around them, and that's how they got the gold. And that the Spanish didn't. They didn't realize that. They were just, you know strong arm in them for the gold. So how does that connect to what I'm talking about today? Now, they drain this lake, they drain this 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 uh, uh, um, this uh, uh, water, this body of water, and that is where the city of Mexico City sits on, according to this documentary. The city sits on that place where the Aztecs had that surrounding water. And so they had Mexico City, and I can't show you all these pictures because I had to change the, the thing. So anyway, uh, I, there were some buildings that are, they're showing that the buildings are sinking down. And the reason why is because they're trying to get to the fresh water and the fresh water is actually under the city. And they're taking so much water out of the under the city, out of the wells under the city, that the water can't hold up the, the, the land anymore. And the city is sinking into the ground. Do we sometimes feel that when we are not connected with the spirit, when we are, uh, this, our well is running dry, the wells that we're that we're uh, uh, that we're going to that is going to cause us to thirst again, that's actually going to make us even more thirsty, um, is well is running dry, and then we start to sink. We start to sink into the ground, and so the Mexico City has a problem. They have to conserve water because they're drinking the water faster than it's filling up. We're faster than it's replenishing under the water, under the under the ground. Mercy. And so they had their day zero. Their day zero was when there was no more water. And so many cities around the world, many cities, many countries have this day zero clock when they will run out of water. They will not have water and they're racing against the clock to find out how they can uh, 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 replenish the supply, how they can get more water. And so therefore there is uh, 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 this dilemma in the world, in many parts of the world where they will run out of water. They will not have enough water for the people. But Jesus says, look, the spiritual water, you will never thirst again. You won't have to keep coming back to this well. You can leave that pot, leave it. You don't need it no more because you got spiritual water 
Amen. And so, we don't understand that the Holy Spirit is holding us up. The Holy Spirit is holding us up as a people. We need to appreciate the Spirit. We need to thirst after the Spirit as a doe for thirsted after the water. We need to thirst after the Spirit. In Psalms, 91, uh, Psalms 51, David, he said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He said, I know I sinned. Forgive me for my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because we know that the Holy Spirit is holding us up. The Holy Spirit is giving us the strength to go through these last days. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one that is going to hold us up through these trying times. Notice what it says in Romans, Romans chapter 5. Let us turn there to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and I'm almost there. I'm almost done here. Romans chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 20. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. I just want you to know something here that you might not know. It might be a little simple for you. But I want you to know, as you go into Romans chapter 5, verse 20, that water runs downhill. It might be simple, but it's a powerful message. Water runs down what? Hill. Now watch this. Woo, come on now. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. You see that? Where sin abound, grace did much more abound. You can go too low for the Lord. His spirit runs downhill. He will meet you at your lowest point in your life and bring you out. Water runs downhill. I learned that as a plumber's apprentice. Um, very simple teaching, but it has a spiritual aspect. The Holy Spirit will meet you. He's a comforter. He wants to lift you up out of that, 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 that miry clay. He wants to lift you up out of the valley of, of decision. He wants to lift you up out of the valley of darkness. He wants to lift you out. Water runs downhill. You never can be too low where God cannot lift you up out. Never let Satan tell you that it is too late. Never let Satan tell you that God doesn't love you. Never let Satan tell you that you're too messed up. That is lie. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Water runs downhill. Where sin abound, grace did much more abound. This is my third point. waters are to give and bring forth fruit living and moving water so once you're filled up once God brings you out of that lowest point once God tells you and shows you and lifts you up and cleans you up and molds you into his image once he shows you how much he loves you now it is time for you to help others. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come into the water, to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy milk and wine without money and without price. How do we do that? How do we buy something without money or without price? Why? Jesus Christ already paid the price for us. We don't need to pay for it. All we need to do is claim the blood of Jesus. We need, all we need to do is show us our VIP pass that says Jesus and has the blood of Jesus on there, and we can get that water. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, 
by an E. Let's jump down to verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. This is a serious warning. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Appreciate that spirit while it is here. One day, it will be taken from the earth. God's spirit would not always strive with man. Notice what it says in verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Get those thoughts out of your mind. No more stinking thinking, brothers and sisters. Get those thoughts out of your mind. Rebuke those thoughts in the name of Jesus. Forsake your way. Forsake unrighteousness, unrighteous thoughts. I know it comes in my mind. Those unrighteous thoughts I have to rebuke it. And I'm like, what? I've been in the faith for 20 years. Why am I thinking that? Rebuke those thoughts in the name of Jesus. Don't just let the devil say, oh, well, since you thought it, you might as well do it. The devil wants you to, he wants you to do that. Since I thought it, you might, I might as well just go ahead and do it. Because Jesus says, if you think about it, you might as well do it. You already did it in your heart. No, 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 no. Brothers and sisters, forsake those thoughts. Don't let the devil tell you that. And let him return unto the Lord. How do we return unto the Lord? Forsake our way, forsake our thoughts. Then we return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy all upon him, upon you. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Wow! Abundantly pardon. I mean, I mean, what's abundant? I mean, you're going to pardon someone? And they can get out there, out of jail now. I mean, but what's abundantly pardoned? Wow, that's another study for another time. Notice what it says in verse 8. For my thoughts are higher, are not your thoughts. Excuse me, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Somebody broke it down, and he says, just to say this to heaven, he's just not talking about the sky. He says, my, my uh, 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 ways are as high as the heavens. There's three. There's paradise, there's space, and then there's the sky. His thoughts are higher than the space. Do you understand how far that is? How far away our thinking is from God? Wow. Our next star is the, uh, I think it's Andromeda. Our next uh, um, uh, galaxy is, uh, is Andromeda. It will take you two million years in complete black space in order to get there. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. Whereas the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So we need to we need to get that those thoughts. We need to think his thoughts. We need to think his thoughts. Now what we put in is what comes out, brothers and sisters. We gotta be careful with that. We gotta be mindful of that. We can't turn on any channel. We can't put on any YouTube video. We can't uh, 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 read any book. What goes in will come come out. First in, first out. Notice what it says in verse 10. For as the rain coming snow from heaven, now he's taking it from the spiritual and putting it to the physical uh, terms we can understand. For as the rain coming down and the snow from heaven and return it not thither, but water it the earth and make it, it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. That water is coming down for a purpose. It is so that we can give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We should be the sowers and if if we're the sowers, we're definitely going to eat. Man, don't work, you don't eat. They say, don't muzzle the box of the, 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 the ox that plow the field. You're going to be fed, don't worry. When you're feeding other people, you're going to be fed. Don't worry. And so, therefore, that's how we know that our bread and water is sure, because we're feeding other people. Notice what it says in verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. This 
rain that's coming down is like God's word, the early and the latter rain. We're going to receive that in the last days. We're going to see, receive both the early and the latter rain in the same month, as it says in Job. So shall be my word that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It's going to accomplish, look, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It's going to prosper you. If you receive that word, if you put that word and apply that into your heart, into your mind, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and then you'll be able to apply that to other people, and it's going to prosper their life. It's going to prosper your life, and, and, and it's just going to be this cycle of, of, of blessing. As we'll see when we go forward, it says, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing which are assented for ye shall go out with joy. He's going to give you that joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing It's going to be praising because guess what? They're not thirsting anymore. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. As we can see, the trees represent people. Um, uh, 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 we're not going to go in that, to that right now. Notice what it says in the next verse. It says, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. The thorn, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, represents the cares and riches of this life. The problems and issues of this life is not going to come up. All those are going to go away. Instead of thorn shall come up the fir tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to thee, be to the Lord for a name. And for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Have mercy. It shall not be cut off. How can I continue? Sister Kim, I need the cord. <laughs> the power is going out. Power. All right. So let's look at this last phrase. And it shall be to the Lord for a name and for a sign. Where does God want to put his name? In our foreheads, brothers and sisters. It's going to be for a sign. The sign represents a seal. It's a sign and a seal. So when, he, when we receive that latter rain, when we receive that word that goeth forth out of his mouth, then... We will receive the name of the Lord. We will receive the sign or the seal of the Lord. How many of us want to receive that sign, that seal? Notice what it says in Proverbs chapter uh, 11, verse 25. In verse 25. We're still on my third point. Living or moving waters are to give and bring forth fruit. <laughs> We're going to Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 25. Please bear with me just a little bit longer, brothers and sisters. I know you're hungry, but God wants to give you some word that will make you never hungry again. He wants to give you a drink that may make you never thirst again. We're going to Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 25. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 25. Notice what it says. It says the liberal soul, the liberal soul, this is true liberal. The liberal soul shall be made fat and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that watereth shall be watered. See, brothers and sisters, we think we're losing something. When we go share and give time to give the gospel out to the world, we think we're losing. Like, oh, man, I'm just going to take up my time. I ain't going to have time to do this. I ain't going to have time to do that. I'm not going to have time to rest. I'm not going to. God wants to give you the spiritual rest, brothers and sisters. And he will empower the flesh. Don't worry. Once you get that spiritual rest, that that the flesh will be empowered to go do the work of the Lord and you won't be tired. 
You will have some good rest when you go to sleep, though. I'm telling you, you work hard. Now, notice what it says. Let's go back. It says that he that watereth shall be watered also. This is a very important principle, especially when you look at the land of Israel. When you look at the land of Israel, if you look at the geography of Israel, God is even speaking through the maps. Man, he's just speaking everywhere. His word is coming down like rain on top of us today. Come on now. We just got to receive it. Ellen White said that some, the rain will be falling around people and they will not receive it. Have mercy. Let it not be said of us. Notice what it says. Notice, notice what it says. Uh, see on the on the uh, uh, map of Israel here. We see at the top. We see the Sea of Galilee, and then coming out of the Sea of Galilee is the Jordan River. The Jordan River is flowing out of the Sea of Galilee. Hopefully, we got that point. Is flowing out of the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. It's flowing out of the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, to the Dead Sea. Now the question is, why is the sea dead? Why is the, dead sea, the sea dead? The sea is dead because it doesn't give out its waters. Its waters is stagnant. Its water is, is, is stationary. It's not moving. It's not living. It's living waters are moving waters. And so therefore, the reason why the Dead Sea is dead because it doesn't share its water. It doesn't share. And so therefore, we need to share our blessings. We need to share our spiritual blessings. We need to even share our physical blessings. We need to share this with one another. We need to share this with the world. And so therefore, we don't want to be this Dead Sea. You want to be like the Sea of Galilee. This waters flow and give. This is how the world, this is how God works. It's a cycle. It's a cycle how the world works. And, uh, you know what? I don't have time to get into that. Okay. Uh, um, notice what this, this says. We're still on the point. Are to give and bring forth fruit. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Here Paul says, I have planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. Some of us are going to plant. Some of us are going to water. But what happens under the dirt? What happens in the heart? We can't do anything about that. That's God's, that's God's job. Our job is to plant. Our job is to water. So we're going to have some people who water and some people who plant. Verse 7, it says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, nor neither is he, uh, neither he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. Our job is to do what God tells us to do. Plant water. Plant water. We need to be spiritual farmers, brothers and sisters, in these last days. We need to be spiritual farmers. Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That principle I apply to where did God put Adam and Eve in the beginning? He put them in a garden. So in these last days, what is going to save us? Because how you going to eat if you can't buy or sell? How are you going to eat? So as the physical, the spiritual, we need to be spiritual farmers, brothers and sisters. We need to be sowing seed, seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We need to be sowing seed so we can bring forth bread and then we can share the word with other people. Now, notice what it says. I, I, I propose that we split up in groups, planters and waterers, planters and waterers. We can develop this a little bit more. But some start and initiate Bible studies and some that water and support the planters. This is something I'm developing in my mind. I, and the spirit, you know, I want to hear from you all the spiritual uh, aspect and way we can do this. But some will be planters and some were waterers. The planters plant, the planters start the Bible studies, 
the waterers make prayer lists of the people in the Bible studies, make prayer lists of the people that are in their church that are wayward, pray, prayer lists for the people who are struggling in the church, prayer lists of people who haven't made it, haven't been to church in a long time. It says we need to pray, we need to water, we need to send the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to go in our in our in our, in our, our um, in our stead, or uh, if we can get in contact with this person, uh, because the Holy Spirit is working 24 hours. We can only work for so long, and then we got to get some sleep. We got to rest these bones. We got to rest this body. It says, and then call and pray with the people in the Bible studies. This is what this is something I just I just wanted to throw out there right now. Let's go to Psalms chapter one, verses one through three. Psalms chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. All right, so we're turning there. We're still on the topic or the point living or moving waters are to give and bring forth fruit. And hopefully you're there by the grace of God. It says in Psalm chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but he delighteth in his law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Watch what it does for you when you meditate in God's law day and night. Watch, it says in verse 3, And he shall be like the tree planted by the rivers of water. He shall be like the tree. Remember I told you that tree represents people. So here uh, David is likening us, those who are not walking in the way of the sinners, who meditate uh, uh, day and night on the law of God, we will be like the tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. Don't we need the fruit of the spirit, brothers and sisters? This is how we get it. This is how we get it. We need to have, be planted by the rivers of water. And verse 1 and 2 shows us how to be planted by the rivers of water. Then we can have that fruit. This fruit will be in due season. And his leaf shall not uh, wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That is a promise. What he, wow. This is, this is amazing. Whatsoever, he, this is a promise. Whatsoever he doeth will prosper. Are we wondering why the things that we're putting our time and our effort in are not prospering? Memorize this verse, brothers and sisters. Memorize this verse. Revelation chapter 1 and verse actually verses 13 through 15 it says in the in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like the son of man who is that brothers and sisters that's Jesus Christ one like the son of man clothed with the garment down to the foot and girded about with the paps about the paps with golden girdle with a golden girdle his head and his hairs were like wool, his and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and and his feet like fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. See, John, the revelator, had an encounter with Jesus. John, the revelator, had an appointment with Jesus. And he heard his voice. And his voice were the voice of living waters. As I said, water flows downhill. I mean, it's almost no lower point than to be in prison, to be separated from your friends and family to be on the Isle of Patmos. So there's there's got to be the no, no lower point than that. And here Jesus comes and he makes an appointment 
with John the Revelator and he gives him the many waters. His voice, his word is that water that comes down from heaven. Revelation chapter for the lamb we know who that is Jesus Christ John chapter 1 verse 29 behold the lamb of God that take away the sin of the world the lamb is Jesus Christ it says which in the midst of the throne shall feed them this lamb is going to feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters we need to follow this lamb follow him wherever we go I believe that's the 144,000 they, they followed the lamb whithersoever he did he went they received that seal on their forehead that sign the name of the father on their forehead and notice what happens when you receive the living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes do you know that God is he bottles up your tears he knows every tear that you cry he counted every tear that you cry he knows all the things he is uh, 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 intimately acquainted with every struggle that you go through he will wipe away all tears from the eyes but we need to go to the lamb we need to be fed by the lamb and be led to the fountains the living fountains of water And then he's going to dry up the fountain of your tears. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Praise him. Praise him. He's going to dry up our, the fountain of our tears. But we got to be led to the living waters. The fountain of living water. So this time. is to go to the Lamb, to be fed by the Lamb, to be fed by Jesus Christ, and then he will, he will lead us to the fountain of living waters. He will wipe away all tears from our eyes. And if he does that for us, should we not do that for others? So my appeal is to allow the rivers of living water to flow out of me, out of you, out of us, to share the truth of God's love to all the world. If you're, if you're in agreement with that, if you purpose in your heart to allow the rivers of living water to flow out of you to share the truth of God's love to the world I want you to type that in the comments I want you to type that in the chat I want you to type that I want you to raise your hand I want you to sing hallelujah we need to be all in brothers and sisters you don't need to have one foot in the world and one foot in, 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 in the truth in the, in the church we need to be all in. God wants our whole heart, brothers and sisters. We need to love him with all our soul, mind, and strength. We need to love him with all of our heart. And he says, guess what? When you love me with all your heart, when you love me with all your soul, mind, and strength, your next step is to love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't want to be thirsty, why would your neighbor want to be thirsty? We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we want to be filled with the water that we will never thirst again, then we should do that for others. Will you allow the rivers of living water to flow out of you? Will you meet and make an appointment with Jesus each and every day, the morning, evening, and at noon? Will I pray and cry out loud? And when we pray and Jesus prays, the windows of heaven will open and he will pour you out a blessing that you cannot receive it. 
And why can't you receive it? Why is he going to give you too much so you can hoard it? No, he gave you too much so you can give it away. He wants to give you so much that you're going to water other people. For all those who made that decision. For all those who decided to allow God to work in them and through them. I pray that you would kneel with me now. So that we can humble ourselves before the throne of grace. That we can come boldly. Not because we deserve it. Not because it is owed to us. Not because we are so good. But because Jesus is so good. Because he paid the price. He said, ho everyone that thirsteth come into the water. And he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Jesus paid the price for you. All you need to do is take a step towards him. And let us seal that with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we lift you up because you're a magnificent God. You're a holy and wonderful God. You're a loving God. You care about us more than we care about our own selves. You care about us more than our own, our mother who birthed us. You love us so much. We don't even understand. And Lord, we, we need to know how much you love us. We need to see that each and every day. We need to have that love built up in our heart. And as we see how much you've forgiven us, we see how much you've pardoned us. You said you will abundantly pardon. Once we see how much you have pardoned us, then we can go and love others the way they should be loved, the way you would love them. We will represent you as if you were there in person with them. So Lord, forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us know. Help us to understand that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and all those things that we know to do. I know there's more. I know there's more things. There's things that uh, we cannot bear now. We cannot understand now. But you're going to reveal that to us in time. But if we can just live up to the light that you have given us today, you said you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, thank you for cleansing us from all unrighteousness. We pray for those who made a decision. We pray that you send angels that excel in strength, that excel in knowledge, that excel in skill, that excel in love would assist those in their decision. But Lord, at this time, we yield to your, your will. We yield to the word. We yield to your Holy Spirit. We pray that he lives in us, moves in us, and moves from without us. In Jesus' holy and wonderful name, amen.